What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and we have some breaking news updates regarding Martin Keenan's Monsters of the Multiverse. Several of you, over the almost 2,000 of you who have commented on the videos I did regarding the leaks of those that I broke earlier last week, asked when is it going to be possible to get Martin, Morton Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse standalone. You already have Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, you already have Xanathar's Guide to our Cauldron of Everything, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and you said, why should I spend $150, and a very rightful question, to get those two books reprinted with just one additional book, this Morton Kanan's presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Well, we all know, and most of you have figured out what the playable race options are from my previous videos, there is still the 250 or so monsters contained in the second half of that book. Well, I can let you know that as of this morning, uh, it was announced that May 17th, you will be able to pick up Morden Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse standalone. So if we go over here and take a look at D&D Beyond's website, this was announced this morning uh, that it is available, and that's probably why you haven't seen it on D&D Beyond to be pre-ordered yet. It's because it's now pre-orderable here because they made the call when you'll be able to pick the book up standalone. So this will likely be available on Amazon and then again, your Barnes & Noble local bookstores. It does not, as far as I can tell, have the option of the other alternative white cover. Seems like the only way to get the alt white cover options of these is to buy the Expanded Rules gift set that launches next Tuesday. Now, I have pre-ordered two of those box sets from Amazon. I have bought two of those from my local game store of the limited edition copies, and I will be doing a giveaway of those. I don't know if Wizards of the Coast is going to send me sample ones. Sometimes they do, maybe. I haven't seen any notifications come through that I'll be getting one. Uh, I might not get them till May when they become available as a standalone book. I don't know, but either way, I still will be doing a giveaway. So if you wanna get those box sets, uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel here and you'll be able to enter that giveaway when it goes live next week uh, or sometime next week once I have the books in hand. I like to have them physically present to show you that I'm not making this kind of stuff up. Um, that being said, uh, the Nerdarchy folks were invited to... So this is something... It's a small nitpick, and I'm actually not that upset about it, but you can see here it says, Wizards of the Coast held a press briefing recently to share details about the upcoming D&D Rules Expansion gift set, which contains new printings of Xanathar's, Tasha's Cauldron, and everything, and the Monsters of the Multiverse. Um, so, as a reminder, I'm going to cut back to me here for just a sec. So, the updated versions of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and Xanathar's Guide are going to be including more recent versions of Errata that Wizards of the Coast has essentially just been sitting on until the printings of these books. Now, are those Erratas going to be game-changing? I highly doubt it, but there may be tweaks to them that are significant enough that might make you want to pick them up. Reserve your choice to pick those up until I do a review on them. I'll do my best to cover any changes as best as I can, so you know whether it's worth you picking up an additional printing. For those of you who've picked them up on digital platforms like D&D Beyond, they'll be automatically updated once that happens. Here's my little nitpick that I was getting at. Wizards of the Coast, and I know this because I've talked to some of my folks and friends that are kind of in the same industry, they do these things where they hold press briefings, where they invite a whole bunch of folks. So a lot of the folks that you'll see do articles, Polygon, ComicBook.com, IGN, Nerdarchy, D&D Beyond, probably Todd Kenrick, and other folks who do these kind of videos, have the interviews and whatnot. They're invited to a press briefing where they're given early access to information about these books and they present them in article form. Usually I thought it was a little bit more than a week prior, but this one happened, to, or at least maybe they were under embargo that they couldn't release it until the 18th. Either way, this stuff kind of comes out there and, you know, they're able to, you know, there's an interview. I don't know if they're able to ask questions, but we'll talk about it. Basically, they explain the concept behind these things and they usually give sneak peeks, sometimes exclusive art, stuff along those lines. And I've tried multiple times to get myself invited to these press briefings so that I could provide that information to all of you with my spin on it and my takeaways. However, through multiple attempts, through multiple different avenues to get invited to that, I haven't. But you know what? I'm okay living in autonomy because then I can drop the leaks and stuff that I find without any 
you know, backlash because I wasn't under, like, I didn't know this stuff from some embargoed interview that I was a part of under an NDA or what have you, and then I was not able to release it till they told me I was able to. If I find some bit of news, I can go make a video and cover it in whatever amount I want as fast as possible. So let's go back to that article because it might answer a lot of your questions regarding the decisions made. And I saw some stuff about power creep and adjustments and things like that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that article a little more in depth. So it says Greg Tito, who's the kind of comms manager, social media guy for Watsi, held a press briefing uh, with the D&D's head of publishing and licensing, Liz Shu, uh, who showed a selection of artwork and illustrations. You can check the gallery below to see more of these. Uh, both the standard version and the alt art cover. Uh, the concept behind the gift set is a book end to the 2018 Core Rules book set, or gift set, which was the reprinted adjustment of um, and the special covers of the uh, Monster Manual Player's Handbook and DMG. The thoughts is you could have these two books and that should cover the majority of everything you need, although we already know that it doesn't because there is no book that compiles all of the magic items found in all of the campaign guides. There are still some races that live outside of those two books. Off the top of my head, the Grung, the Lakatha are two that come to mind that don't exist in those books, as well as the uh, you know campaign-specific ones, Loxodon, Vidalkin, and so on. Um, but even things like the Verdan, which was from Acquisitions Incorporated, which is set in the Forgotten Realms, um, whatever. Anyway, um... It releases on January 25th, a hobby store exclusive version. Uh, the press briefing, Tito and Shu say, uh, they talked about details on the multiverse, specifically touched on the recent leak of this book, <laughs> stating that Watsi is looking into the matter and tracking down the source. Okay. Uh, Pre-orders for Monsters of the Multiverse began January 18th, 2022, including through D&D Beyond, as mentioned above. Jeremy Crawford, uh, principal rules designer of D&D, joined the briefing in greater detail of Monsters of the Multiverse. He described the book's origins as a dream of theirs to combine all of the monsters and playable races into one volume, specifically the ones not found in the PHB and the Monster Manual. Okay. Among all races in the book, Crawford noted how the Tortle, which has been a part of 5e for several years, and only now appears for the first time in an official book. I thought the Tortles appeared in um, the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. Um, okay. Anyway, there are total 33 races in the book. Crawford put in design approach to this book in two directions. Game design and balance along with storytelling potential or the team's top priorities, uh, which like much of 5e is dedicated to player feedback. I know a lot of people may balk at the particular piece of game design and feel the desires weren't represented, but it's worth keeping in mind there's millions of people playing D&D. Um, from a design standpoint, the book aims to deliver comparable power and versatility to all the race options with a goal of providing everyone a chance to bring something unique to a group of characters. Crawford did explicitly say these options are intentionally more powerful. On the storytelling side, the team sought to streamline the material and also remove specificity. This is answering a lot of the questions that you guys have had. The latter is why race features like the lizard folks cunning artisan is no longer part of the package. I asked whether Monsters of the Multiverse would include these sorts of features in something like a sidebar or appendix, and I was asked, uh, pleased, Tito selected to ask. The answer was no, and Crawford explained how they did not want to create limitations or barriers for players' imaginations. Perhaps the lizard folk in your setting, or even in an official adventure, may be portrayed in a classic, ray, classic way, rather, including cultural qualities like cunning artisan feature represents. But by removing things like this, it entirely removes the potential to create expectations. Personally, I think this is kind of a drawback, though only if because I've played a lot of 5e with a heck of a lot of different characters and I've enjoyed leaning into those features. This is the artist speaking, or the Arthur here speaking. Uh, players can still do these things, but all things considered, they do, uh, they do have mechanical components too, which will be gone going forward in official products. I don't know what the new Lizard Folk features will be and use this race as an example of my question simply because it crossed my mind. Well, we kind of have an idea from the leaks. It's just not there. Uh, many of the monsters in the book, especially those with high challenge rating, are much more uh, dangerous, according to Crawford. In my notes at this part, I wrote to myself, if the characters are more powerful and the monsters are more powerful, is it a wash? A great question. We'll have to wait and see, but Crawford did note how they change monsters uh, now have to earn their challenge rating. We've talked about this in the past, 
that challenge rating is not, or at least maybe prior to this book, was not a viable option because the, you could have encounter one challenge rating four monster and a different challenge rating four monster and wipe the floor with one and get completely destroyed by the other. Uh, what he meant is prior monster design sought only to reach a single criteria for justifying, uh, justifying the CR of the monster by challenge rating table in a DMG. He described how stat blocks contain a sort of ideal path of action economy to fulfill that criteria. In other words, if a DM didn't recognize this path and follow it, then the monster likely didn't feel properly representative of the challenge rating. That's a very useful, insightful information. Their new design approach uh, incorporates multiple avenues to achieve challenge rating benchmarks, and there's more clarity and guidance for doing so baked into the stat blocks themselves. As game designers ourselves, I asked if the systems reference document would receive an update. This is the SRD, the open game license, something that a lot of us have been asking about extensively uh, because there has been significant updates to the base game. For example, adding a new base class in the Artificer, folks can't write stuff outside of the D DMG or the DMs Guild. That's why you don't see any third party books that are published producing content for the Artificer because they're illegally not allowed to. You can't do that. It would be illegal and you could be subject to repercussions from Wizards of the Coast. Now you can release stuff for free on the internet if you wanna come up with a homebrew thing and post it on your Twitter or your Tumblr or whatever you want. But if you wanna make money on it, uh, the only way to do that on an official thing like that that doesn't exist is to publish it on the DMs Guild because that allows you to do so, but Wizards of the Coast takes a cut of it and that's the kind of trade off you pay for using official stuff. Um, okay, uh, there are many monsters in that resource also appearing in the monster manual, and I wondered if the SRD would integrate these new designs, but unfortunately the answer was no. So this actually came from a design standpoint, which is also interesting. You are only allowed to use the, so if a new, if there's a monster that exists in some form in the SRD, the sort of open game license document, and they updated its stats and updated it in a bunch of different ways, in Monsters of the Multiverse, and it's now a fundamentally an entirely new creature the way you face it, it will not receive an update in the open game license, so the folks using that have to use the original one. They can't use the updated one. If I'm honest, I'm not sure what this might mean for third-party creators, if anything, but I was glad I asked, and they selected my question to answer. Near the end of the briefing, Crawford explained how the concepts and design approach in Monsters of the Multiverse is in line with what Watsi plans for the revisions of the core books planned for 2024. He reinforced those revisions are meant to be backwards compatible with the original sources. My interpretation of this is while the core game system still forms the foundation of the material, it may very well be wildly different in execution. With increased power through character race option and increased power of monsters, it seems reasonable the revisions indicate a power increase across the board, which would render the original yet compatible material moot in practice. But we'll see how it all comes out and I'll let you know. You can order it, blah, blah, blah. Here's the links. Then here's some more art that we see. Um, we can take a look at some of this art together here. Um, some Morgan Kanan looking at some folks hanging out through a scrying cube or scrying orb. Um, let's go ahead and see. I didn't. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, we got some. Looks like Tasha maybe. I like this kind of cartoony style art. I really like this. I would want this on a DM screen. Honestly, it's got Tasha, a couple other folks. We've got a Kieran. We've got, you know, it's like maybe it's a Beholder. I know it's Xanathar, right? There's some Grung hanging out over here. Orcus, Zugitmoy, Kobold over here. This is the new, um, the art for the new DM screen. And then a couple others. Maybe they might be from like a bot, the external box. Oh, so the white. Oh, Okay. The white box comes with that art on the DM screen. So I'm actually pretty excited about that if I'm able to get one. So uh, what did that say? The multiverse shines with countless wonders, yet I've seen so many of them that I'm rarely awed. Not so with the Kieran. They fill me with awe every time. I like that. I, I really like the art for the box set. Super excited for that. Okay. So there you go, folks. I do think the folks from Nerdarchy did hit some really key points on the head there. Um, I've been saying this. A lot of us have been kind of hearing and talking about the rumbles in the community about what does it mean for 2024's redone rules? Are we going to see an adjustment? Are we going to see the removal completely of the open game license so that if you want to use the new updated lore and rules for Wizards of the Coast content, 
Uh, you have to go through the DMs Guild or you won't be able to publish at all. I'm not sure. Again, that Darkest Timeline video is still coming at some point in the future, uh, but I want to work with some other folks to get other people's opinions on what their thoughts on are, are on it. Uh, but yeah, uh, it does seem weird if you're going to give the monsters a power increase and you're going to give the player characters a player increase, why did you bother in the first place? They're not... Clearly, it's not that the players were underpowered and needed to be buffed, and the monsters were underpowered and needed to be buffed. If you buff them both, then you, you're you not really effectively doing anything, except further excluding the things that haven't been adjusted, right? So all of these new monsters in Morton Kane's Monsters of the Multiverse have been updated, but that means all of the monsters found in the Monster Manual have been kind of left behind. Same thing with all of these 33 new races in this book have been updated, whereas the original, whatever it is, 12 or so races from the player's handbook have been left behind. And it's kind of shitty because those races will, be, those races and those monsters from the original kind of core set will be left behind until 2024. So you could be playing with these new books with the new races and the new monsters and be on a power level here and you have to wait two years to get your player's handbook and monster manual races up to that level. And that seems like a weird business decision. I get that it's kind of a slow, phased approach that they're attempting to do to kind of ease you into this, but if my DM's like, oh man, I love these new monsters, I'm gonna use this book almost exclusively, and you're like, cool, and this player's like, I'm gonna play a Shatterkai, and this player's like, cool, I want to play a tiefling from the player's handbook. I'm going to be underpowered. I'm not going to be able to cast my tiefling spells with spell slots. I want to play a non, uh, you know, a gnome or a dwarf that's not found in, in this particular book. And I also understand that that's probably also why they did the thing where they made them sort of their own standalone sub races, or they made them sort of their own standalone races rather than as a sub race, so that those other races can stay at this level and you don't have to go back and reference that book to get all the stuff you need for this book. So that's why they added all the stuff so it's a one stop shop reference guide. But it still bugs me because we're just leaving these other things in the dirt for two years. Right? And that's assuming that these new rule books come out in January. This updated printing or whatever it is comes out in January of 2024. It'll be two years. If it comes out in the summer or later, it's going to be two and a half plus years before we get three new books that are going to reprint. But I think, again, you can fundamentally take the differences and adjustments found in these books that are coming out, the expanded gift rule set, specifically Morden Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse. That will be sort of the template for what you're gonna see going forward. So if you don't like what's there, I'm sorry, that seems like it's what it's gonna be, but if you do, rejoice in the fact that your other books will get reprinted in two years time. So thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.